intelligencesquared.com. I'm going to ask Benedict Allen to come up to the podium. Benedict, like most of the people on this stage, needs no introduction. I'll just remind you of some of his achievements across the Amazon basin, the first to walk a thousand miles down the Namib Desert, a sole traverse of the Gobi Desert, most recently um, crossing the Siberia with, um, on a dog uh, team across the Bering Straits. He's got nine books to his credit, uh, but perhaps most famously invented uh, the role of the television adventurer, getting rid of the editor, the cameraman, and performing everything himself. He's now got the even greater challenge of looking after two small babies in Bristol. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh. <clears throat> how, how, how are you all doing? There's only three more of us left. So to hang on in there. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, one of the prerequisites of being an explorer is that you report back. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that process. Um, I had written about five books uh, about my different adventures and different peoples around the world. And one day, a very nice man, a very polite man from the BBC rang me up. You know, it's the phone call that everyone's waiting for. And this man said, um, we've got this thing, a video camera, um, this invention. Uh, would you like to take it on one of your journeys? And I thought, brilliant, money. And he said, no, 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 we can't actually pay you. Um, but could you just take this? And I said, oh, fine, where is it? And he said, well, no, you have to buy it, actually. The one, one, I've, got in, <laughs> one I've got in my hand is... Um, is mine, BBC property, but if you could secure one, um, could you um, film one of your adventures? So anyway, uh, I thought this was a, you know, a lovely idea, and um, I took this camera off. So um, how this, this telly career came about, I think it's sort of quite interesting in a way, that I had this idea of crossing uh, the Amazon Basin at its widest point, from the Andes up there in the northwest, right through there to uh, Mato Grosso. Um, and um, I took this little video camera along, um, Anita Roddick, I'd met at a party, and she'd rashly said, is there anything I can do to help? And I couldn't think of anything at the time, but then I said, I need a camera. Very, very sweetly, she bought me this camera. So off I went, went to the Andes, very excited, started this big adventure, and I had this little camera. I don't know if I was, if I was suffering from the sun, but I, I sort of felt inspired while riding a horse along a cliff path to start my filming. Um, and the horse just didn't like this idea, and it just went berserk, and um, began running along this cliff path, and just looked intent on committing suicide. <laughs> and although, you know, it would have made a lovely dramatic opening for my, um, <laughs> my filming career, but it wasn't looking at all good, and I, I, I just jumped off this horse, and uh, landed on the camera, cracked three ribs, um, and that was the beginning of my filming career. Um, and I still had um, 350, no, 3,500 miles to go of this journey. Um, I don't know if you've broken your ribs. I mean, it's really bad. I was trying to carry rucksack, really in agony. Got down to the, low, the lowlands, um, uh, the river Putumayo, um, and uh, saw these aircraft flying by. I thought, this is exciting. I'm on, on a major tributary of the Amazon, but why all this aircraft? Inevitably, it turned out I've uh, come across the, the drug um, uh, business. Um, and... Um, I, um, I won't go into this, but I thought, this is too good to miss. I've, I've got to put this in my, my Amazon film. I've uh, got out my little camera. Um, these are the, uh, that's me in action. Uh, you can see how primitive the cameras were in those days. You can see how primitive I was, actually, <laughs> with, um, my handling of it. This is one of my, an image I took from one of my first uh, bits of film. Um, you see a bag there, of, uh, it's two kilos of cocaine. Um, <laughs> I, we obviously know all about that. Um, no, I... Uh, no, this is just everyday life there, and um, you know it's a busy, busy trade, a cottage industry, very, very open. Um, however, no one really liked me filming it, and um, <laughs> I, I won't go on about this too long. But um, I found myself paddling my canoe up a very small tributary, trying to get away from two hitmen, um, and it's, it actually wasn't all that funny at the time. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad you think it was, but um, it's. Um, no, it's really quite serious. I was 20 metres ahead of this uh, bloke in a canoe, and he had this big rifle, and I was essentially waiting to die. And it, it was, obviously, being British, I didn't paddle too fast. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, I was waiting for this, this terrible um, bullet in my back. And it, no, it really was a bad moment, I, I really. And, um, but I, I, they kept on missing. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, it turns out that, you know, I hadn't thought about this, assassins come in every different level, like every other profession. You get the first-class assassin, 
And then you get your, you know, that one always gets it right somehow. Second uh, class assassin who more or less gets the job done every time. And then you get the third rate hitman who makes a total mess of it every time. And that's what I had. Um, the, <laughs> these men weren't those two people, but um, they kept on missing me. And I discovered they couldn't multitask, these people. They didn't know how to effectively paddle a canoe and kill someone at the same time. And um, what happened in the end was they were going round and round in circles. Um, and um, I, I jumped from the canoe um, into the forest. And um, I, I got away with it. And um, this was very near where I jumped into. Um, and um, suddenly, at a very uh, an important moment for me, this I jumped into the forest. Um, and I realized that I was suddenly safe. This forest that we're taught about as a place that's full of snakes and piranhas and all these terrible things, of course, uh, that's vastly exaggerated. And um, in fact, now I had a haven. This place could look after me. And it was a reminder of uh, perspective. You know, we think of ourselves as uh, explorers, but of course, this wasn't a hostile place to the indigenous people. It was their home. We gave them their food, their medicine, their shelter. Um, and um, a huge reminder for me. Um, I carried on, lived with the uh, Matses Indians. They, they helped me uh, learn some basic uh, survival uh, skills. But of course, it wasn't survival to them. As I said, it was just home. Um, and so uh, these are the sort of things I was managing to start to convey. I'm um, needless to say, the BBC didn't want that film. Um, <laughs> after all that, um, they did ask me to go back, um, and I did start um, a, 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 a sort of telly career. Um, this is uh, my second uh, series. The BBC still didn't pay for it. I want to say this one's called The Skeleton Coast. Um, I, um, well, that's me, obviously, getting tangled up uh, with my wires. Um, but again, the, the camera started to work in all sorts of special ways. No longer was I... This business, you know, you see on the telly uh, expeditions, they all generally have to be set up for the camera crew because otherwise the camera crew would die out there um, and you wouldn't be able to get their vehicles in and so on. So things are set up. But this was wonderful, a real live expedition with all the nitty-gritty, the ups and downs, the hopes and fears. Um, the key to this expedition turned out to be Nelson. Um, <laughs> there was this wonderful uh, camel who... He was a very, very sheltered camel, I ought to say. Um, but by getting him on my side, um, uh, I managed to do this expedition. This is when he suddenly realized, walking up the Namib Desert, Southwest Africa, he realized that um, he had to go up and down sand dunes, which wasn't his thing. So <laughs> at this stage, um, he's looking back home, wanting to give up. Um, um, and, and things carried on. He'd never met a woman before. Uh, this, these are the, the, the people called the Himba, who are absolutely wonderful. They were training me before this expedition, helping me understand the, this arid environment. Um, so that was another little incident there for Nelson. But the Himba um, were absolutely uh, wonderful to me, H brought me in, sheltered me again, coming through with the camels. And I discovered that the cameras were very, very good. They weren't, you know how difficult it is taking a still photo sometimes of uh, people who are strangers. The camera actually in this case turned out to be a wonderful method of communication and bonding. They, the Himba would film themselves, um, do whatever they like with my camera, and it was a way of really getting to know them. Um, meanwhile, Nelson still having his troubles. Um, this is a giraffe we came across. Um, it's a bit of a weirdo giraffe. Um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it politely, um, but he wanted to have its wicked way with Nelson. Um, and um, giraffes are very observant animals. They're very curious animals. I think it just thought that a, uh, a camel was a sort of giraffe. Um, and, it, and the giraffes aren't. Um, used to camels in, in Namibia, there's very, very few camels. Um, but anyway, this camel kept on licking its lips, you know, and it's all very disgusting. Um, <laughs> but, but again, these are the sort of things I could carry on. It's a bizarre incident, not at all normal on any expedition. But this sort of thing, you know, the ups and downs of a real-life expedition um, was, um, I hope, bringing it alive um, to the audience. And finally, coming out of the Namib Desert, Nelson still wasn't totally happy. This is a sort of controlled descent. Um, <laughs> he's... He's the last camel there. But we were working it out together. And actually, um, at the end of this expedition, I come to see that desert as more like home. And that's a, a lot of it for me. It's about trying to get rid of the exotic, trying to forget about things as the other, as I said earlier. It's about trying to see a place as somewhere that is, uh, well, I suppose, seen on its own terms. And camels could do that for me, dogs in the Arctic, and, of course, the indigenous people all around the world who do see these places as home. And I'm sure Robin will talk about that in a second. Um, this is me uh, in Mongolia filming a vet, actually. Um, 
if you're wondering what on earth is going on uh, behind me, there's a, 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 one of the, well, a horse being looked at. Um, and uh, then just about across the Gobi Desert, I'm being sold three of the dodgiest camels in the whole of the Gobi, um, which is why these two men are smirking. Um, uh, I think, it, I don't know, it's time up almost, one, one minute. Um, three, um, I'll just tell you a bit about these camels in my last minute. Uh, the camel on the, uh, the one on the uh, left, that's, uh, uh, he, he, well, um, yes, he, he was um, called Bastion because he was meant to be the strongest camel, a very, very powerful beast. He staggered whenever I even put my little baby uh, plastic tripod on the um, camel. <laughs> so he was useless, but it was better than Jijik, the middle camel. Jijik was very clever. Um, you don't want too many clever camels on your expedition. Uh, <laughs> And so he was no good. Then there was Bert. Bert only had one hump, and um, he was meant to have two. He was a battering camel. He also only had one eye. I couldn't help noticing. Uh, so anyway, carried on with these expeditions. This is leaving the edge of the Gobi Desert. One, I'm, as I entered with Kermit, uh, and uh, you see, I'm talking to Jijik, trying to bond with him. I knew he was going to be trouble. He was looking for escape routes all the time. Um, and uh, walking off alone now into the Gobi, six weeks ahead of me, a thousand miles, very, very exciting, very, very scary. No one in the world knew where I was going to be because I don't use a GPS or satellite phone because it's all about immersion, um, all about trying to get to grips with the place. So off I went, um, again trying to talk to Jijik, the tr tricky one, Bert in the middle with his one hump and Bastion carrying absolutely nothing um, <laughs> at the end. Um, walking across the Gobi. Um, sort of thinning out a bit. Beautiful, beautiful place, the Gobi Desert. Very, very exciting. Uh, but I remember talking to my camera at this stage saying, oh dear, um, it looks a bit like the moon. I don't um, think a camel's going to like it here. Um, and Gigi clearly heard this and was thinking, oh dear, it looks a bit like the moon and I don't think a camel will like it here. Um, and at this stage, he went on strike. Um, he wouldn't move. He decided to walk home, um, <laughs> which is what he did. Um, and I'll, I'll just round up now by saying... Um, Thank goodness those two other camels uh, did stick with me. Um, but you would have thought, poor old Bert. I mean, um, even, even at this stage, um, my moment of need, um, Bastion didn't hang uh, on uh, with me. He, just, he still refused to carry anything. Um, well, um, that's all I want to say about my expeditions. But it, as you see, uh, for me, it's about uh, immersion. It's about uh, trying to get to grips with a place and see it as not alien. Um, and in conclusion, I'd like to say that I think expeditions or exploration isn't really about a lot of the things that we think it's about. It's not about planting flags. It's not about conquering nature. It's not about going somewhere in order to make a mark. Or at least I don't think it should be. It's about opening yourself up, making yourself vulnerable, and allowing the place to make its mark on you. Thank you.